Madeline is an LA local and the host of the daily program Press Play on KCRW. Helen was part of Princeton's first graduating class that included women, and it was at Princeton that she first became involved in activism. Thank you. Uh, both of you have been so thoughtful about this conversation. Now, you guys have actually been talking to me about things that you would really like to talk about, ideas you had for this. And something Helen said to me just today was that you really wanted to talk about being creative in storytelling. Well, that's part of it. But also, <laughs> um, where do we go with it? I mean, there are good stories, but what is the message? Where do we want to go, especially in this point in time? And I don't mean go tomorrow. I mean, where do we really see where we are and what that means five years from now, 10 years from now, for the audience, the um, customer base, the humanity that we're looking at um, in the future? So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm so curious because I am in the the quotidian, the day-to-day, -day. Um, I'm sort of in the ever-present. Mm. And so I guess I'm curious to know how people synthesize the current moment, especially when the current moment changes every moment and is so fraught and is so emotional and how they, are, how they can form a larger and longer narrative, if that's even possible. Are we in a moment where we can't even conceive of a future, really? We can't even conceive of a long-term narrative? I feel that way. I know that you don't work in daily journalism, so you probably have a very different perspective. But I, I can't even understand what next week is going to look like, much less to 10, 20 years from now. Right, right. We're in, I mean, it's really interesting. We're both, um, I, I consider myself a recovering journalist, <laughs> and you are in daily journalism. I've never been in daily journalism, but I, I, I have always watched the news closely, except for the last couple of years. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I write books, so now I am really in the long form, and in fact, shameless, uh, this book <laughs> is gonna be out in January. It took me 12 years, so how to make something like that relevant. So yeah. you're having a, you know, a day-to-day -day focus, and I'm really trying to think about, well, but what does this mean? And what will it mean in the future? And where have we been in the past that we can draw from to understand this moment yeah. that, we're, that we're in too? Yeah. Because too much of media is really just like the here and now. And we forget that there's been, you know, uh, five or 6,000 years of civilization that we can actually learn something from. Right, right. It, and it's so easy to get caught up in the here and now and be on your phone and looking at the, the, the endless barrage of stimuli. What, I wonder what we're losing by not thinking about the long term. And do you think that this is a way, in a larger sense, when you look at history, a way to exert authoritarian control? Because when the people, you guys, aren't really looking at the big picture, then it's easy for somebody who has Mm, authoritarian tendencies to exploit that. I was just talking to somebody about the situation in Hong Kong, which, as we know, is a, is a special administrative um, area of... We, we were talking about yes, that, actually. Was, you were saying that, and I was like, yeah. I think that's me. I think it was Yes. Us. And within, uh, you know, a couple of decades, what, three more, it's going to, or less, yes. um, it is going to be fully absorbed by the People's Republic, and, and we know that there are many... Um, resistance groups, and I mean, if we think that freedom of speech is a question here, can you only imagine mm -hmm. what people in Hong Kong are feeling right now? And the thing is that it, the, the noose, if we call it that, we is can. tightening so. centimeter by centimeter. And if you get people, you know, and what are we experiencing here is that you get people so, you know, running around like Chicken Little every day, and so up in arms and freaked out about very real threats. I mean, really horrible, um, well, we already heard a bunch of four-letter words, right? Really horrible shit <laughs> every day. And then it is easy to lose sight of yeah. the fact that if we only go, uh, you know, a couple decades earlier, what was it like, you know, um, when on the day Japanese Americans right here in Long Beach and San Pedro had to pack up and lose everything? What was it like 
in the McCarthy period where people just for having a political dissenting view could completely lose everything and potentially land in federal penitentiary. What was it like, you know, if we go further back when, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, backlash against the Civil War and the Reconstruction happened and, and the suddenly- Chinese Exclusion Act. And the Chinese Exclusion Act. I mean, we have, and you know, if we go abroad, I mean, you know, even though people say we shouldn't talk about Hitler and Goebbels, I think we're seeing a playbook after playbook after playbook about how lies can be told and, you know, fake news, reporters can be made the enemy, truth tellers can be, um, you know, assassinated, and, um, and nothing happens, right? And we're supposed to not make those parallels, but um, we can really see yeah. real examples in history. But so what I'm saying is, you know, we as people, as human beings, have been through this in the past, um, so my question would so, be, yes. because both of you are asking these questions very real, something that you deal with when writing and putting your show together. In practical terms, how do you make, or how do you encourage someone to have perspective when it seems so difficult, oh, even for yourself? Uh, yeah, that's hard. Well, read your history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> read, period. Um, I, I, well, I interviewed a guy today on my show. I ha did a two-hour election special, and most of it was live. And um, mostly we interviewed experts, but then we also had people, uh, we had call-outs to voters <coughs> about their reactions. And I interviewed a guy who's Japanese-American, a Republican a Trump supporter, whose uh, parents were, um, well, I guess grandparents, were, were in or interned and uh, here in Is California, we? so part of the <coughs> Japanese internment. And we were talking about immigration and the caravan of immigrants coming up from Central America. And I asked him on the air, did he see any parallels between the rhetoric that's happening around of this caravan and his, his background and his grandparents? And he said, absolutely not. <coughs> he saw absolutely no similarities because his grandparents were legal immigrants. And these people were not legal immigrants. So I guess, you know, what I'm taking from this <coughs> is something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, and that is our increasing tribalism these days. And the fact that all of us in times of stress, strife, panic, anxiety, fearfulness, are clinging to our tribes. He is clinging to a tribe that he has decided that he is part of this group and not that group, and he will, refuses to see the similarities, even though he does know his history intimately, he knows it personally. And I think a lot of us are doing the same thing. And the big question is, <coughs> what is gonna take us to break out of these tribes? Is it even possible? Because I think by human nature, we are tribal <laughs> as right. humans. Um, What's, well, what does it take, do you uh -huh. think? <laughs> well. <laughs> flip it back on you. I mean, I think I definitely agree people tend uh, towards tribalism and also to simplify a situation, like they want to make it very <coughs> me versus them, or this versus that, and how do you nudge someone to see it differently? With that premise? Oh, no, no, go for it. I, I don't think we are, human nature is naturally tribal. I mean, you know, any of behavioral scientists can go into that. I think people can be manipulated into tribalism. Um, there is a whole other, um, element of humanity that is about universality and the ability to uh, feel compassion for a child that may not look like your child and to feel like this is a child and, and, and uh, or these are people who need protection or they need food or water or something basic and I as a human being, uh, they may not be of my quote tribe, whatever that is. And, and that's a whole nother conversation because I think the, the I think the political moment that we are in, and, I, and by the way, I'm, I got my census form, you know, we were among the random people to figure out, and I'm not sure how to answer some of the checkoff boxes, but that, that's the whole thing, that the movement, especially I would say in the latter part of the 20th century, has been to identify which group. Now, where did that come from? It might have come from both the left and the right to do that, and um, 
Um, but in any case, I, I don't think we are naturally tribal. I think that there has been a lot of movement toward that, and the media has played, we, the media, have played into that. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, I, my uh, journalism and media experience has been in magazines, which were the original segmentation, you know, demographic segmentation thing. Now we are even more into that for all of the data, you know, data splicing that we're into now. Like, what little dot can we reach? And that's about tribalism. You know, and, and I don't need to tell any of you about how um, while um, the advances in uh, media have really expanded our ability to reach people, it's also made it possible to just focus on our little own little dot. And so how should media correct its course then if, if media has been somewhat or a lot, depending on your perspective, responsible for people going against their nature, then what is the way to right the path? Well, <laughs> as someone who <laughs> talks about tribalism, because I'm glad we have a point of disagreement, because it would be boring if we agreed yes, on everything. Right. But I, I do think that in times of strife, we tend to man the barricades. And w one answer to you is, unfortunately, what broke people out of, out of tribes in the past has been an enemy, a common enemy. So like I think during the 50s and the 60s, 70s, I rem remember, we had Russia, Soviet Union, the Cold War. And so we as Americans could band together in the face of this common enemy. World War II, he had a couple common en en enemies. So anyway, aside from that, uh, what can the media do now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I try to do every day is to, to push against that because the whole idea of a reasonable discussion on public radio is to bring in all different kinds of perspectives, have a reasonable discussion, even when you disagree, and learn something and move forward and realize that you are connected, even if you are. I mean, today on the air, we had Republicans and Democrats and no party preference people all on the air together, all civilized discussion, all having different perspectives, and yet they all did have a common point of view, which was surprising to me. They were, they did not want any more of the, of the crazy fighting going on in Washington. They all wanted politicians to stop doing what they were doing and focus on issues like health care and, uh, and taxes and what have you. But in the current age, I feel like that a reader and a listener would like to have a little more guidance than just being presented with do you want you disagree again with my premise? No, no finish. Just, yeah. I, I was gonna. So rather than being presented with a multitude of perspectives as they are, you know, just broadcast someone else's opinion. I think this is my interjection: is that people would like guidance. What are, what should we give more weight to? What should we not be giving weight to? Um, I would like to get to that, but also come back to your earlier question about. Um, what can we as media do about it? And I, I think we have to remember that media is driven by money. You know, we are a capitalist society. Um, every magazine I've worked for tried to stay afloat. Some of them tried to make a profit. Ms. Magazine just tried to stay afloat and um, still exists. But, um, you know, the segmentation, and one of the things that, that I knew in the profit for profit magazines that I worked for is what, why do people buy media? Fear, sex, and uh, money. Those were the main themes when we talked about what to put on the cover. And we were saying, you know, um, earlier that... Fear sells. Fear sells. sells. And when Trump was running for president back in 2015, 2016, Les Moonves, who, you know, is now not there for many reasons, but as president of CBS, he said, um, Trump may be bad for the country, but he's really great for our bottom line. And so we have to also recognize that that mentality is what also um, helped promote him. And to your um, guess that you had earlier, he didn't really know his history. You know, he was a second class citizen, his grandparents were second class citizens, and there have been studies done about the internment of Japanese Americans and the role of the media back then. And um, for example, the Denver Post, they did studies about selling the paper. And when they produced headlines that showed how evil 
and how dangerous Japanese Americans were, they sold a lot more papers than when they said, well, they're really not a national security threat. So that, you know, that partly is what drives things. And um, what can we do about it is, um, I was really listening very closely to John Jay this morning, and he was talking about, you know, the learn, unlearn, and relearn. And, um, and one of the things I really believe is that we have all been drinking the poison for a long time. We all learned about each other, about society, about history, about Columbus, and all those things, more or less from the same master narrative. And there is a lot of poison in there. And why can't people get along? Because we're too tribal, we never can, or things like that. And so there's a big hunk of that that we have to unlearn. And as media creators, you know, we either examine that, we get curious, we ask questions, we challenge, why do I believe that? How do I know that? You know, is, is what he said true? And there's not enough of that going on. You know, having guests on, news people that just don't get challenged from the White House, you know, on. And we ourselves, as the, whether we're, we see ourselves as conduits or creators, we have to do that, that unlearning and relearning ourselves and really learn some of that history too to, to just say, well, wait a minute, no, that actually is not true. And here's what really happened. And in terms of what you were saying about wanting to be told, uh, Rephrase your question. I said, I feel like there are people that want to be guided. Guided. There are okay. so many perspectives being presented and maybe without enough structure around it or without enough framework that it's hard to know what am I supposed to take from this? Is everything equal weight? No, nothing, no. But I hesitate to say you have to think this or this is the way for you to think. I don't want to do that. That's not my job. And I don't think that should be the job of journalists. But you select. I select the stories that I think are important that you need to know. But I present different perspectives on those stories. I don't say that this perspective is exactly the same as this perspective or what have you. But I think different opinions, different viewpoints, I'm not saying different facts because that's a different issue, is healthy. If you're just going to hear one viewpoint, then you, are, you will be in your tribe of that, per, of that group of people who only think one way, and you won't be challenged. And I think what's important is for you to not be a passive consumer of media, but to actually be challenged and to seek out different opinions and to challenge your own received wisdom. How do you judge whether your work is effective? Whether what you've been trying to do with your program is achieving that with listeners, or for you, whatever you set out to do in your writing, are there metrics for you to know? How do you get feedback on that? Well, I know we're in a very metric data-driven world now, and that's always the, but quality. You know, I, I used to work with the public radio station in, in uh, the Bay Area, KQED, and there was a whole thing about, well, but what about the quality of the news? How do you do the metrics on that? And so for me, as a writer, uh, there are a couple things. One is, you know, from book sales. You know, is anybody buying it? Is anybody reading it? Where is it in the libraries? All of those things. Um, from a, a, a publicity, you know, uh, point of view, where is it getting picked up? And, and those things. So those are ways. But another intangible is how many people come up to you. And for the book, my first book, Asian American Dreams, of people who come up 20 years later and say, I just read your book and it really spoke to me. I mean, that and, or it, uh, it, it made me change my career direction or something like that. Mm -hmm. That also is a, is a piece of it. And I know there are many metrics for And we have a lot of metrics. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have ratings, all sorts of stuff. So I know roughly how many people are listening every quarter hour. I mean, I don't know what they're thinking. I can't read their minds. But again, I have a similar situation. I'll meet people out in the world, and they'll tell me we have fundraisers, and they, we have people calling in or writing in about what moves them and why they give money. And I think that speaks volumes. If they're giving money to support this programming, then obviously they like it. And a lot of people talk about it, that it is a lifesaver for them. I've, they use that word 
all the time. That if we don't know what we would do if we didn't have public radio. Um, maybe that's because they're in their cars all the time. <laughs> There's not a lot there. But uh, I, I don't know. So it's, it's mainly anecdotal. We do have the data, as I said. But I think it's just mainly anecdotal. And again, it's just like person to person co contact. And I think that the thing about radio, which is different from other media, is that it is so personal because you're often listening by yourself. You're in the car or you're in the shower or whatever, usually in the car, and you're not with other people. It's not a communal activity listening to the radio. We're not in right. 1930 anymore. So it, you have a powerful connection to that voice. A lot of people say to me, oh, I think you're just talking to me, which that's really mm -hmm. powerful stuff yeah. and, um, and humbling as well. So uh, when I'm broadcasting to the void and I don't see any, anyone, Right. <laughs> Both I, of you. <laughs> it's a, well, I just imagine that there's like one person sitting opposite me, and I'm telling that person a story, and I'm I need to visualize who that person is, and that person is someone who is smart and curious, and maybe hasn't done the research that I've done, or hasn't in, doesn't know the person I'm about to interview, and I'm telling them a story that will hopefully give them more information for them to lead a more meaningful life. Both of you mentioned anecdotes in terms of the way that you think about the effectiveness of your work. And that's one thing I wanted to ask you guys about, is how you incorporate considerations of your reader, your listener, into the work you do. But I feel like Madeline's just sort of answered that exactly, like picturing this person that she's speaking to. Is that true for you as well, Helen? Oh, yeah. I, I think about, well, you know, when you're writing, a, a, doing a project that takes a, a lot of effort you go through highs and lows, you're by yourself, you're, you know, internal, and you're thinking, who cares? Who gives a shit about this thing that I care about and I've spent so much time on? And then there's part of it like, you know, the why. Well, then why am I doing it? What is the meaning? Why is it important to me? Why or how can I make it relevant and important to somebody else? And so there's also a um, trying to gauge a sense of, uh, take the temperature of, of, if I'm writing about China, which this book is, or my other ones about Asian Americans, what would the average reader know about Asian Americans, for example? Many don't even think we read English. Here is a book in English. You know, um, how do I address that level of you know, ignorance or incuriosity or whatever? I want them to get something out of it. I want to elevate them. And then here are other people who are going to know a lot. And so, um, so having to, to just kind of balance the, the different audiences that I know are there, or about China uh, or Asia, a lot of people can't find Asia on a map, let alone China. Or if you say, I'm from Taiwan, they're going to say, oh, I like Thai food too. You know, and, <laughs> and that's, a, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so kind of knowing that about your audience um, um, I, I would like to say about the selecting topics, mm. like the influence and the connection. Yeah. You're, you know, you're a gatekeeper. Yeah. And we all, as media people, we are gatekeepers. So you pick the topic, mm -hmm. and your selection of a topic is what is also going to speak to your people, right? Yep, yep. And, and uh, that's an insight and that, that we all do. And I, and I have to say, for people who cr create ads or, um, you know, um, you know, if I'm watching and seeing a lesbian or gay couple and their children on there that is, has nothing to do with the car that they just bought or whatever, you know, it's like, whoa. And I, and I used to, as a child, talk about Asian sightings. When I saw an Asian on any media at all, it would be like the whole family would run to the TV <laughs> set or like, whoa, look. And, and, but that makes a difference. Oh, Madeline's... Um, Subject today is something that I thought I only cared about. And this is where we really sort of reach people's hearts. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? Isn't yeah. that? Yeah, definitely. And that is not something that you can, I mean, you can, but then you're taking all the joy out of it. Focus group it. You know, it's got to be something that you feel passionately about and that you have to, as a creator, and I you know Ira Glass talks about this a lot too, it's like you create this thing and put it out there and hopefully you make a connection. Right. But if you're gonna think, okay, what is it that people want and then try to, try to do it, reverse it that way, that doesn't work. 
So part of it is having experience, and also part of it is being kind of a, I think you have to be a humble humanist, too. So it's easy for me to talk to my people. Like, I know exactly what my people are interested in and who they are. I mean, middle-aged Jewish woman. I could talk to <laughs> you forever about whatever. Um, <laughs> but, but that's not very interesting for everybody else. So there's, there's a constant balance with that, too. Both of you have spoken a lot about providing people with perspectives and also making selections, right, in what you broadcast, and then encouraging people to be thinking, right, thinking readers and listeners. I also wonder, do you hope that the people who listen or read you will go out and take action in some way? In your work, are you ex inciting action? No. Do you want to elaborate <laughs> on that? No action. <laughs> well, other than be an engaged person and well, care about the world. That's an action, world. isn't it? You, yeah. you want it's, them it's to care. I don't mean a specific action. action. I'm not telling people go vote for A or B or go right. pick it or go do that protest. That's not what I'm interested in. But if you were to select another topic, uh, you know, aw away from politics, let's mm -hmm. say violence of any kind, you know, you're not wanting them to commit violence. Yeah, there's no violence on all sides. All people, they're good people on all sides. There's none of that. Or I know you've but done programs on homelessness in LA, mm -hmm. and mm. that might be less touchy than politics, right? Maybe there is action to be taken there. The action is not, um, I'm not going to tell people, go out and volunteer for the homeless, or go and, um, you need to accept a homeless shelter in your council district and not be such a NIMBY. I'm not going to say that. But what I am going to do is put a perspective on the air that says, this is what happens when you're a NIMBY. This is what it means. Like, think bigger than just your particular block. And also so by the guests you choose, right? right? That might point them in a certain direction. I mean, I, I, I got into um, journalism and then writing by being an activist first. I will say that. I mean, I see creativity as a, a, a way to um, bring our common humanity together and hopefully move society uh, in a direction that is um, toward peace and toward justice and those kind of things. I don't tell people how to vote or anything like that, but I've written stories about uh, sexual harassment, you know, um, campus rape, things like that, uh, hate crimes, and not telling people what they should do, but my hope is by who I interview the perspectives I show, the organizations that I choose, and maybe to have a little help box too. Want to get involved? Here are places you can contact. You know, if you think, if you want to volunteer at a homeless shelter or at a domestic violence shelter, here's how you learn about that, mm -hmm. separate from the yeah. story. Yeah. Um, but, but in doing that, I mean, I, I actually do think there's no such thing as a, a absolutely objective thing by just the choice of our subject matter, the choice of who we have on. I agree. And, you know, I agree totally with you. And the, and the Mencken quote, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, that's mm -hmm. what I think about all the time. I mean, I think that's, the, that's what journalism is, too. When you, it's one of the goals, I think, for me, practicing journalism. It's our noble goal. Yeah, is to hold the powerful accountable and to give voice to the voiceless. So it, I guess that's some kind of, if that's some kind of activism in a, in a more so. kind of abstract so. way, then yeah. But it's also about, I guess it's, it's about having a, a view of a, of a liberal democracy where people, people's rights are, all, all people's rights are respected, where it's not just the rights of the powerful that are respected, but that everyone's rights are respected. And... Journalists are the ones, or well, I mean, there are many, there are activists and stuff, but, but there is a crucial role for journalists to keep that idea alive. Because if the powerful are not being held accountable, they're just going to do whatever the hell they want. Because Absolutely. power is quite addictive. And the only thing I think that can constrain them is knowing that they might get into trouble. <laughs> you know, and who's going to get them into trouble? How do we meet those responsibilities? If that's a responsibility to hold the powerful accountable, what can, maybe not just the two of you in your roles, but what would you say to writers and journalists 
and broadcasters. This is how you meet the responsibility you have. Well, there are many who are doing that work, who are going through all of the data, who I'm waiting for the tax returns to be revealed, and who will be going through those with a fine-tooth comb. And so that's part of it. The people who slog through and do the hard work of, of reading every word and comma in a uh, you know cong congressional bill or something like that. That's mm -hmm. all part of the work or going to a, a school board meeting. And I have to say that there are times we can certainly point to um, where things, uh, people have fallen asleep or whatever. When did we not notice that the redistricting was happening in such a ridiculous way? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been going on for decades now. And so those are part of the, and, and something we can learn from. And to say, okay, where did we fall off the watch on this or got too complacent about it or felt that it didn't, um, it wasn't worth the bottom line, you know, and, and I think that's a big issue. Uh, I think for daily journalists now and content creators, one of the big challenges is the 24 seven, um, you know, news cycle we're on. I mean, every moment, right, there's something new to jump to. It doesn't give a lot of time to do the necessary digging and the necessary homework. Uh, we were talking earlier about Wen Ho Lee, yeah. the um, Chinese-American scientist who was falsely accused of being a spy for the People's Republic, and I don't know what you wanted to well, say about that. I, I want to hear what you have to say about it since you co-wrote his book, right, with him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well okay. I guess in that, well, I remember I was in Washington when that happened, and mm -hmm. I remember the press corps immediately jumping all over him. And I, I think a lot of it was, um, part of it had to do with racism, too. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and, and, and your interpretation of that. Why were people so eager, willing, and quick to believe in his guilt? So that was 1999. And what happened was the New York Times on its very front page above the fold said that there was a spy at Los Alamos Nuclear Labs, one of our most secret laboratories. All they do is create nuclear bombs. And he was one of the scientists there. And there was an unnamed spy who was worse than the Rosenbergs. And we know what happened to the Rosenbergs, right? And it was so here this guy was uh, tried and convicted on the front pages of our most, um, you know, one of the most esteemed news organizations. And what was the cause of that? Then everybody jumped on it, like you said. And uh, yes, it was racism because there was an assumption of guilt. And from a news point of view, and these are like Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who um, were rushing to get the scoop and to outscoop each other. And so do you have time to actually double check and see, do we actually have any evidence that says? And so it just gained momentum. And, um, and we are in that moment today, by the way, too. There are, uh, Wen Ho Lee was a uh, well-known, you know, because it was on the front page of the New York Times, it was a case that almost went to the Supreme Court to challenge the First Amendment and his privacy rights and was settled by the New York Times and CNN and all of that stuff um, because they didn't want it to go to the Supreme Court. Um, but we're in a moment today where uh, there are so many Asian American and especially Chinese American uh, business people, scientists, um, you know, they're not nuclear physicists. They're people who, if they leave the company that they don't like uh, because they've never been promoted in 20 years and go somewhere and create their mom and pop company, they are immediately slapped with an industrial espionage lawsuit that brings in the uh, FBI. And there are like hundreds of those cases right now. Um, if it's not an Asian person, let's say like Uber and Waymo, which has a lawsuit, it's called trade secrets. And that is a civil suit. And that's been going on and it's going to be settled. Nobody got arrested. Nobody got thrown away. And we know that since Putin is our friend, China is the worst enemy of all. And so um, in the case of Wen Ho Lee and these other cases, it's a career maker for the FBI, anybody mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. to find a Chinese spy. And you know there are many studies that say every Chinese waiter, every Chinese student, 
is a potential spy for China. And you can't dispute a negative, you know. Uh, so you're, you're a spy, prove that you're not, you know. And so th our responsibility is to, within that rush to judgment, um, is to be able to stop and to challenge it. And yeah, and I as mean, you say, it's harder now than ever before. I mean, you reminded me of that Rolling Stone story right. uh, at UVA right. where the woman... The fraternity uh, uh, rape. Yeah, the, the, the woman who accused yes. the, this guy and the fraternity of, of raping her, and it was a horrible story, but it was coming in the wake of all of these stories about campus sexual assault, and the reporter just went with it. Right. And it became, and it was not true. And it became a huge journalistic scandal right. um, from the other side. And I don't know if Rolling Stone has recovered. I'm sure that journalist hasn't recovered her reputation. Right. But I think it did a lot of damage to all the credible stories, which there are far more credible stories of, of sexual assault and campus sexual assault. So there's the long-term ramifications for not doing our homework. I wanted to refer back to a conversation the three of us started, and I feel like we didn't really finish, and it was about this quote, <coughs> the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. I actually checked, but you can interpret it either <laughs> way. Right, did your fact okay. check. It's fine. Yes. Whichever way you want to <laughs> interpret it. But the question you were asking each other was whether you believe it. So do you? Oh, wow. Gosh, really? But finishing with finishing. the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> with well, an easy question. I do believe it, I will say. And I, I refer to that quote often. And, you know, as I was saying earlier, if we look toward history, I mean, we got through the McCarthy hysteria. We got through, 30 years later, there was an apology for the internment of Japanese Americans. It's a lesson to us today about let's not intern everybody who is... Muslim or who might, quote, mm -hmm. look Muslim. And, and so the arc of, 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 of history, history or prefer. universe is long. It bends toward justice if we make it, we help make it bend. We have agency. We, you know, can I just say, some of the other speakers have referred to that, you know, we're here, we're proto a protoplasm, and then we die. You know, I agree, in general, that's true, but that piece of being alive is partly, you know, the why. So what? What are we doing here? And what can we do to make a difference? And that's the piece that will help bend the arc of, of, of history Towards or the justice. universe. Toward justice, yes. yes. Getting a yes. <laughs> I, okay, yeah. <laughs> no. <What she> yeah. I have to say, it can be really depressing when you focus on the day-to-day, -day, the quotidian, right, of course. and you see the two steps backwards and the one step forward. Or five that or steps back. 10 or 20 or what have you, and you see what's happening, you're like, ah, oh, this can just, things can change like that. Right. Things can change like that, too, because, sure, we can um, change in the bad way just like that, but then we can have gay marriage in a second. Like, it really was a second in historical terms yeah. and That's changed amazing. everything for so many people. And, uh, you know, so it, that does give me hope. And you're right about being a protoplasm. And yeah, you die, and what, what does it all mean, and all that. But I think w when you live in the ever-present, I'll just bring it full circle yeah. to what, the beginning of our conversation, and you think, okay, I'm just here in the present. I can't, I'm not going to think about the past. I'm not going to think about the future. I'm just going to live for now. A, a, a valid thing these days when everyone's into meditation and just being Shanti and all that. But I think that can be an excuse not to act and not to, not to position yourself in the long arc of humanity. And we are all on that long arc. And mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to be part of it and not to step off. <coughs> because if everybody did that, we would be, you know, protoplasm living in the mud and not doing anything and not right. creating and, and not realizing our full potential. So live in the present, but really live in the present but see where you are in the art. <coughs> yeah, and, exert. and keep your eyes forward and keep your eyes backward, too. And doing nothing is still doing something. I mean, doing nothing is an action as well. So we can choose to do nothing and be a protoplasm, or we can at least be part of that glorious civilization.
I agree. Thank you to both of you <coughs> so much. This was such a pleasure. Thank you. My